All right, so my name is Richard Young. Here are my Twitter and GitHub details. And I work for a company called Binary. We have a very interesting tagline, if you can read that. One thing that we've learned is that you have to be quite careful when you want to print that tagline on a t-shirt because t-shirt printing companies don't have great quality control. And somewhere out there are two developers wearing t-shirts, one that says hashtag bullshit, <laughs> and another one that says hashtag no bullshit no. <laughs> so anyway, I am a reformed Java developer, now working primarily in JavaScript. And I spend a lot of my time uh, rendering React code on the server, writing web applications that don't run on the web, and deploying Node applications using Windows Installer. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about RxJS and observables. RxJS has become quite popular because it's an integral part of the newer Angular versions. Uh, but today I'm not going to be talking about Angular. In fact, I'm not going to be talking about any framework in particular. Instead, what I'm going to look at is how we can use normal JavaScript to up our async game. I'll start off with a few simple examples to get an idea of how observables work and the RxJS syntax. And then we'll move into some more interesting examples like uh, canceling and retrying. So what do we mean when we talk about async with JavaScript? Well, it's pretty much any action that takes a set amount of time to complete or does not respond to the user directly. So some examples are DOM events, like button clicks or on-scroll events, AJAX calls, animations that run over a period of time, web sockets where the browser and the server can communicate asynchronously with uh, TCP calls, and server sent events where the, the server can send HTTP calls to the browser whenever it wants to. So what is RxJS? RxJS stands for Reactive Extensions for JavaScript. It's part of the ReactiveX library for composing asynchronous streams. And it has implementations in many different programming languages, not just JavaScript. RxJS uses something called observables, which we'll get into shortly. But essentially what it does is it allows us to treat a stream of events as if it was a collection. It also provides us with a list of operators to manipulate these events. You can kind of think of these operators as Lodash for events. So RxJS uses observables, and that's pretty much an implementation of the observer design pattern, if you're familiar with that. There's also a uh, proposal for observables to become part of ECMAScript in the future, and RxJS is an implementation of that spec. Observables operate on streams or sets with any number of events in them, even zero events, over any amount of time, and they're lazy, meaning that no values will get produced until it's actually subscribed to. Observables can also be unsubscribed from, and the underlying producer can be stopped or even torn down. So let's take a look at some quick examples. The first example that you will always see on every RxJS uh, tutorial is how to create a stream from an array. We do that by saying observable.from and we give it the array and we can then say dot subscribe. The function that we pass into subscribe will get called for one, once for each item in the stream. So the output of that would look something like this. We'll just print out each item in the array. When we want to interact with the DOM, the usual way that we would do it is we would get hold of our button using some sort of query selector, and we would then say add event listener and tell it which event we want to listen to. We can then give it a function that will get called when we click the button. The way we do this with RxJS is we'd still need to get hold of the button using a query selector, but we can then say observable.fromEvent, pass it the button, and tell it that we're interested in the click event. We can then say dot subscribe and pass it a function that will get called each time we click the button. So this looks pretty similar to our previous example. What is the benefit of doing it with RxJS instead of just using event listeners? 
Well, like I said earlier, it's kind of like Lodash for events. We get all of these cool operators, like throttle time, where we can just chain them onto our observable, and we can do things like throttling and debouncing without needing to import any additional libraries. So let's take a look at a quick implementation of that. The button on the left is a normal button, and it doesn't matter how fast you click it, it's going to print out once for each time you click it. A throttle button, which is throttled to one second, when you click it lot, it's only going to print out a maximum of once every second. So what about promises? Promises were developed specifically to solve async problems in JavaScript. Well, let's do a quick recap on what promises are. So promises represent the eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation. They'll either pass or they'll fail. That's why I like to think of them as Yoda functions. Do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> or what seems to be the case with promises, there is no retry. Promises get executed immediately, they produce a single value, and they're immutable and cannot be cancelled by design. So let's go back to that list of async uh, examples that we had in JavaScript earlier and see how all well promises work for that. So DOM events produce multiple values. Promises only work for single values, so promises are probably not a good option for handling our DOM events. AJAX produces a single value, so I guess promises will work for that, and I suppose that's why we have so many promise-based AJAX frameworks. Animations probably want them to be cancelable. Promises won't work for that. And WebSockets and server sent events also produce multiple, eva multiple values. So of these examples, we can see that AJAX is the only one that really seems like a good fit for promises, and that assumes that you don't want to cancel or retry very easily. So it looks as though promises were maybe not what was promised. All right, let's take a look at a quick AJAX example. Let's assume we have an API endpoint, slash API, slash Jedi, and that returns us a JSON array of Jedi from Star Wars. The usual way that we'd interact with this endpoint is by using something like jQuery, or if you're above using jQuery, you'd use something like fetch, or whatever your framework provides for you. And uh, we'd then pass through the, the path on the API that we want to call from, and we'd then say dot then. And that's when we resolve the promise. Note that the actual AJAX call gets made before we even say dot then, so it's not lazy at all. We've then got a success function and an error function. The success function will get called with our data if our AJAX call was successful, and the error function would get called if there's a problem. To do the same thing in RxJS, oh, sorry, we'd also, this is what the output of that would be. We'd print out the array as one object, it comes back to us as one payload. To do the same thing in RxJS, we can use the built-in observable.ajax. If you don't want to use RxJS's AJAX library, you can also say observable.promise and use a different one. That will return us quite a lot of data. We're only really interested in the response, so we'll map that to data.response. Optionally, we can add a catch and a finally, which should be fairly self-explanatory. And what we'll do is we'll set this observable equal to a variable called Jedi dollar, which is the convention for naming observables. It ends in a dollar, so that you know that it's an observable and you can use all of these cool operators on it. And at some point later in our application, we can say Jedi dollar dot subscribe. Similarly to promises, we've got a success function and an error function. But we've also got a third function that we can pass through, which is a stream completed function, which will get called once there are no more values in our stream. For Ajax, we've only got one value that we're getting back, so it'll just get called immediately after our value is returned. This also prints out just our array as an object as we'd expect it to. But if you remember the very first example we looked at, we converted an array to a stream. So if we now take our data.response, which we know is just an array, and convert it to a stream using the same syntax, observable.from, now what we have is 
two separate observables, one inside the other, observable stream inside an Ajax observable. So we need to merge them back into one observable. So we'll use merge map, which is also known as flat map. And that'll flatten it out into one stream, which will this time now print out each item in our array on a separate line, because our subscribe function is going to get called instead of just once for our full Ajax payload, it'll get called once for each item in our array. The benefit of doing this is that we can use all of those Lodash-like events, like filter, where we can filter out Jedi's that will become Sith Lords, or we could use take to limit the number of results that we want to display. So what about retrying? Generally with promises, this can be tricky to implement, but it's definitely not impossible. People are doing it everywhere, and there's libraries that can help you with it. With RxJS, it's as simple as adding the retry operator and telling it how many times you want to retry. If you exclude the uh, parameter, it'll retry indefinitely. So you might want to combine it with something like a timeout. Now we'll make an Ajax call. And we, if we have any kind of an error, we will continue retrying until a maximum of 10 seconds have passed, in which case we've figured out, OK, the server is clearly not responding, and we can end our stream. Because it's probably not a good idea to spam our server continuously for 10 seconds, um, it's, it's already going down, so it's going through some issues, what we can do is we can use the retry when operator to add an extra condition onto when we want to make the retry. So we can use delay when with an observable timer of one second to say, let's wait one second before we retry. So what this code will do is retry once a second for a maximum of 10 seconds. What about cancellation? We know that promises can't cancel. That's, that's kind of like by design, which is one of the, the advantages initially of, can, of promises but then people realized, hang on, what happens if we need to cancel something? Well, let's have a look at how we do it. Actually, first, why, why is it that we don't see cancel buttons on internet loading screens? Can anyone think of a website which does have a cancel button? But also, hopefully most websites don't take too long to load, so the developers are kind of thinking, well, it's fine, we'll, just, we'll, we'll make this Ajax call, um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but also, it's pretty hard to implement. But the reality is that if you have a slow internet connection, it can sometimes take quite long to load, especially if your connection drops. You're just going to see a loading screen forever. The user's going to end up having to refresh their browser. But also, I know of some corporate reporting tools that take a good, a good couple of minutes to return when you try to generate a report. So in general, not being able to cancel is a pretty crappy user experience. We know we can't do it with promises, so what about observables? Let's take a look at some code. What we can do is create an observable called cancel dollar from a cancel button. And we can create another observable from an Ajax call. And now we can just add the take until operator and pass through the cancel button. Now what will happen is we'll make an Ajax call and if the Ajax call is still in progress and we click on the cancel button, we will cancel it. If we're using observable.ajax to make the call, the underlying XHR request will actually be canceled as well. If you're using a promise-based Ajax framework, we won't be able to cancel that, but we can ignore the response from the promise when it does return so that it won't affect our UI or our application state. We could also combine that with a timeout. So we can then say, take until either we receive a cancel or we time out after five seconds. It's a pretty easy way to add quite a lot of usability into your website. Let's take a look at an example with multiple promises on a page. So we have two buttons on our page, a Jedi button and a Sith button. And each of these makes an Ajax call to a different API endpoint. And that returns us a list of either Jedi or Sith and then displays it in a result div on our DOM. Can anyone see any potential problems with this? What happens if we click on one of the buttons 
and then the user quickly changes their mind and clicks on another button before the first one is returned. What happens if the user double clicks on buttons? Why would a user double click on a button? Users do these things. <laughs> so best case scenario, your first data is going to flash on the screen and then be replaced by the second uh, or the correct data a second later. But it's actually a race condition. And if we have two Ajax calls out in the air, we have no idea which one's going to return last. Because the one that's going to return last is going to overwrite the data of the other one. And it might not be the, the, the one related to the button that the user clicked last. So let's take a look at a quick implementation of this. We have two buttons, show Jedi. When we click on it, it makes a request. Jedi are a bit slow, so it's taking a while. But when it returns, it shows us a list of Jedi. Show Sith, a little bit faster, returns a list of Sith. If we click on Show Jedi and then change our mind, we see some Sith, and then a few seconds later, gets replaced by some Jedi. The user clicked on Sith, and now they're seeing Jedi. This is a problem. If we click on the Show Jedi repeatedly, we can see that our Ajax call starts stacking up. So what we're going to end up with is our result screen flashing a couple of times, once for each time that they've clicked. And if they clicked incessantly because their computer is a bit slow, you're going to get this output window just flashing continuously. And if it was an editable text box, it'll just overwrite all of the stuff that they uh, had, all the changes that they've made. So how do we usually handle this as developers? Well, our first instinct is to just lock down all of the buttons as soon as anyone clicks anything and let's wait until <laughs> we get some kind of a response. Then we can open up the buttons again. But that's obviously not a great user experience and sometimes we forget about a button and it adds a whole lot of unnecessary code. So how can we do this with RxJS? How can we solve this problem? We already know that we can cancel requests by using the take until. But this could start getting messy because we'd need to remember to add take until to every single place that we were making Ajax calls that could interfere with each other. RxJS gives us a slightly easier way to do this using an operator called switch map. What switch map will do is, as the name implies, switch over to the most recent inner observable and discard any ones that are still in progress. Let's take a look at a code example. So we're going to create two observables from our two buttons, our Jedi dollar and Sith dollar. But this time, we're going to use the map to operator to map it to a constant value. The value that we'll map it to will just be the API endpoint that we want the button to call. Now we can create another observable called result dollar. And we can use observable.merge to merge our Jedi and Sith observables. If you click on either button, we're going to have an event that will appear on our result stream, but it's obviously going to have a different value depending on which button we've clicked. Then we could add our switch map operator and map it to an observable.ajax to make the Ajax call, and then, as usual, would subscribe to it and set the result on our UI. So let's take a look at an implementation of this. So, same as before, show Jedi takes a little while to complete. Show Sith is slightly faster. If we click on show Jedi and then change our minds, we can see that it cancels any other in-progress events that are still on our stream. Show you again. The same as if we click repeatedly on show Jedi, we're canceling anything else that's in progress. All right, so we've seen a couple of different ways to create observables. We can create them from arrays, from DOM events, from promises, from Ajax calls. How else can we create them? Well, just like promises, you can create them from scratch using the observable.create. Instead of calling resolve um, on a pro like you would on a promise, you would call next. And because observables can produce multiple values, you can call next a couple of times. In most cases, though, you wouldn't need to create your own observables. Uh, it can get a little bit hairy, 
And there's already quite a few ways to create observables, and they're quite extensible. We can create empty observables that will just complete immediately. Uh, an interval will create an observable that emits a sequence of values at a given interval. Um, of will just emit the, the values that you pass it as parameters. We can create a range of values to admit as a stream, and we can create a timer that we can have emit after a set amount of time and then continue emitting. One of the more interesting ones is we can also use observables to wrap a WebSocket. Now what will happen is we can, well, our subscribe function will get called once each time we receive a message on the WebSocket, and if we wanted to send a message, we can use the next function which we can call on the observable return from subscribe. There's a couple of other ways to do this, uh, to create observables. What about observable operators? So we've already seen uh, examples like throttle time and take until for cancelling. We can also use observable.do, and that's good for performing side effects like logging, or I actually used do to uh, trigger the animations on the previous slides. There's also to promise. A lot of Angular developers might be familiar with this. They don't want to learn RxJS, so they just to promise all of their observables, and uh, it's nice and familiar. You don't need to do this. Observables are pretty easy to use, and uh, calling to promise on it will only return the most recent value that was in the observable stream. You're also missing out on all of the cool things that you can do with RxJS. We can delay by a set amount of time. We can group by a certain property in uh, one of our, uh, in our streams. Uh, we can do things like debounce. And there's also all the usual things that you'd expect to find when manipulating collections, like first and last. There's also a whole bunch of other uh, operators out there. So where can you learn about these? Well, reactivex.io forward slash rxjs is a good place to start. That's the official documentation. And there is quite a detailed API for each of the operators there. LearnRxJS.io has got some nice real-world examples on where you'd use each of the operators, uh, as well as some links to some videos and extra resources uh, to find out more about the operators. RxMarbles and RxViz um, are nice ways to visualize how observables work and how the, the various operators um, affect streams. They use something called marble diagrams, which seems to become to becoming a, a popular way to, to represent observables. So maybe some of you have been avoiding RxJS or didn't know about it. Uh, and I know some people think it's quite hard to learn and it has quite a steep learning curve. If you combine too many operators or you start off with very complicated scenarios, um, you are going to feel a little bit lost. But I hope that today I've shown you that it does have some very concise and easy solutions to some historically hard problems in JavaScript. And while observables are probably not ready to replace promises just yet in the mainstream, I hope that you'll be able to go out and start using them in your own projects. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So, so the question is, is it really, is it hard to debug it? It can be quite hard to debug. Um, usually, though, you would chain your observables onto one another. You wouldn't have them nested inside one another, if that, if that makes sense. Um, it can be a little bit tricky to debug, so that's why it's probably better to start off with a simpler use case and then add on operators as and when you need them and when you fully understand what they do. Yeah. So the question was, how do you test observables that are dependent on time? Uh, th there's quite a lot of debate on that at the moment. Uh, some people have got some ideas on how to do it, but the official documentation under testing it says, we're not quite sure how to do this. If you have any ideas, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this, this isn't something that's new. Testing asynchronous code has always been pretty hard. 
Other questions? Yeah. I'm not aware of any benchmark. Um, I imagine that it would probably, observables would probably be faster because the way that they work is they actually set up a pipeline. The initial creation of your observable sets up a pipeline once when it's, when it's first declared and that pipeline is optimized to, um, to process your stream really fast. I know they did a lot of performance optimizations in RxJS 5, so I would assume that it is quite fast but in terms of benchmarking them against promises, I'm not sure. Yep. Using RxJS. Well, I mean, these examples here are, are complete in themselves. The only thing that I didn't include was the import at the top or the require or whatever you're using. So it's quite easy to, to just include RxJS in your client side and use those things where you want to use them. Uh, but I think the, the RxJS framework itself is a, a little bit big, so I wouldn't kind of import it just for one or two small things. But it, it's pretty easy to get started with it once you include it in your project, and you can kind of migrate slowly from promises to, to something else. You go, go look at the API docs and see exactly. <laughs> I'm a little bit scared to make any bold statements about operators that I'm not uh, very familiar with. Uh, this side of the room I've been ignoring. Any questions there? Yes. So, so if I understand the question correctly, you're saying what happens if it's not a request, if it's a response? So it would still be part of the, the AJAX call, I would guess. Um, obviously, the browser has no idea whether it's a request or a response, or whether it's actually hit the server or not. Uh, but it will be canceled at a browser level. So it's however the browser wants to handle that. You won't, you won't see anything coming back. We need to handle anything from that. Yeah. If you have a look in the, the network tab of your browser, you'll actually see that the request will, will have a, a status of cancelled. Yeah, so, so it can get a little bit interesting. Um, ju just to repeat f what he said is that what happens if there's any side effects on the server? So what, if we're not just retrieving data directly from the server, if we're actually registering that we're a Jedi or a Sith on the server, um, you know, how do we kind of handle that? Because it's, it's all good and well to, to ignore that on the front end, but you've already got something that's maybe persisted on the server. Um, so yeah, you'd have, to, you'd have to think about those things quite carefully. I mean, you're not going to be able to just suddenly replace, um, replace all of your code with this and, and have it work magically. Um, but you're gonna have the same problem anyway with your architecture if you're using something like promises and your user disconnects. So it's not something specific to, uh, to this library, but it's something you'd need to think about more generally. Well, if we've already consumed the, the result from the slow call from Jedi, we've already rendered that, because that'll get rendered immediately. So we, we're not canceling anything on the client side, and uh, because JavaScript is uh, single-threaded, we don't actually have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. What we can do is, um, just kind of let that happen, and whichever one comes back first will get, will get rendered, if that makes sense. What we are doing is just kind of handling only the async part of it with RxJS. Uh, yeah, so, so th there's quite a lot of interesting funnies with, with RxJS, things like that. Um, but your best bet is to, to look around to find somebody that solved the problem with that similar to that. Um, so, so it does. What you would usually try and do is um, map the observables to each other. So you wouldn't have them as separate observables running separately, uh, but you would map them into one stream so that you can manage that sort of thing. And then you can manage the order in which they would return as well. Well, so, I mean, I guess the first thing is identify if you actually need RxJS. Um, if you don't need it, like, it's cool to learn about, but maybe don't add it in just because you want to add cool features. Uh, but also, the, the kind of quickest thing that I can see is that you can create an observable from a promise quite easily. And what you won't be canceling the actual network request, but I mean, unless your network requests are taking really long, that's not really something you need to worry about. But then what you can do is take the result from those AJAX streams and convert the result itself into a stream, and then you can manage it as a collection quite easily. I'd say something like that is, uh, kind of the, the easiest way to, to integrate it.
All right. Anything else? Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>